everyone. We're ready for another live with CCO. We're on episode 74. These are um, times that we get together where we look at topics that you sent in, but we don't have that um, real high level intense uh, looking at scenarios and cases and stuff, we're more casual. We have a little more fun with it. And we do get a lot of questions that are uh, fun to discuss and maybe help you think outside the box. Tonight's is just like that. It is, can you travel with medical coding? The fact is, yeah, you can. So we're going to discuss that. I'm going to give you some tips. Also, I'm going to give you some points to think about. If this is something that you're considering, the pros and the cons, is this going to be something that will work for you? Also, uh, just you know, a little caveat there, there are situations that you could run into that would make this inconvenience, troublesome, uh, problematic, you know, the negatives. And I tried to uh, figure those out for you in advance. Now, we know that our world uh, or our genre in uh, the coding or the medical field and the coding industry has moved to more of a remote, uh, maybe we could call it the remote era, right? If uh, COVID did anything for us, it did allow us the opportunity to start uh, taking advantage of electronics that have been around for quite a while. And people have talked about working remote and a lot of companies did allow remote, although they didn't really pull the trigger and say, okay, you know, uh, we're going to mostly be remote. They kind of hold on to the way they've always done things. And that's just habit. That's what we normally do. And, uh, Many of us knew that working remote is an option across the board for different areas in the industry because we've been working remote for a long time and it worked out really well. So I know I've been, you know, probably remote for a decade and uh, just working remote period is does have its pros and cons. It is not what most people think it is. And there are a lot of advantages, but there are some hiccups and some disadvantages that you should be aware of. I mean, you cannot do a remote coding job from your dining room table when you have children. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be productive. You're doing yourself and the company you work for a disservice. However, if you have the opportunity to travel, can you do medical coding? Well, let's let's break that down. There's different types of um, concepts behind traveling and working at the same time. Now, most of you, well, there's so many options that when someone makes that statement, can you do medical coding and travel? Well, are you talking about, you know, vacations? What are you what are you talking about? Uh, just going to remote jobs? Because we know that it has become quite an industry to be a traveling nurse. So you go, you find out where the positions are, you travel there, you do temp jobs, which again, it's not usually like one week. No, these are contracts for like three months, six months, stuff like that. And you have a recruiter or a company that you usually work for, and they uh, find out where these places are that need that temporary help. They send you out, and then you come back to your home base. Um, however, there are other options uh, when it comes to coding because they don't have travel jobs that you can like travel, do the job and come back to your home base. That's not really uh, an option that I've ever heard of for, because it's just easy that, that you would do remote. Now, if you're a contractor and you're auditing out um, companies and that's different, that, 
that would be something like, hey, we've got a job in, um, I mean, I've got a three clinic system in St. Louis and I'm going to go and spend a week there and I'm going to audit them out and I'm going to live in a hotel while I do that. Or I'm going to go live with my cousin for a week, da, 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 da. You know, yeah, you, that's, that maybe is an option. However, you've got to be pretty independent and it's very resourceful because it does cost a lot of money to do traveling work. That's got that's built into um, doing your job. And uh, those are usually contract bidded out jobs where you're going to go do external. So we're not talking about that. I'm talking about a production coder, um, what I call in the trenches coder if you do local work. Now, when I say local and traveling, that's where I um, was saying that probably you would have a home base and you would go to another location, but you didn't have to work full-time at that location. You could be on um, work from home as well. Now, I just went to a conference in Jefferson City and uh, they were, uh, an orthopedist came in and they brought, he brought in several people from his practice and the coders had asked if uh, their coding department, if they worked remote or not, or not. And they said they were hybrid, that they, uh, their coders came in one day a week and he wanted to be able to have that personal connection with his team. So he made sure that they came in once a week to go over questions and um, keep that relationship. Uh, and I know that others have said that they come in sometimes once a month or one week out of the month, things like that. So they haven't completely broken away from um, uh, being in-house, but they work remote more than they work um, in the office, but they have that, that home base. If that's the case, then could you live somewhere else and come in for that one time a week or that one day a week or once a week a month? Yes, you could. That could be a traveling option for you, uh, especially if you didn't live too far out. So let's say, for example, where I live in the Ozarks of Missouri, it would take me, uh, if I wanted to work out of St. Louis, it takes me about three and a half hours to, to drive up to St. Louis. Well, if I only had to go up one week out of the month and be in house, sorry, I got a fly that just decided to attack me. I'm not going insane and waving my hand around. Uh, that, that would be doable, especially if I had a place to stay or family to stay with. Even maybe one day a week might be doable. Now, prices of gas and things, that's that could make a difference there. Um, or again, you could carpool if you had people around you, but but that's kind of unlikely. So that's one option. Uh, I don't think that um, that you'll see that as far as people living extended distances. So say I I live here back in my home area of the Ozarks, but I want to work back in Texas and or they which which I do do stuff in Texas still, but but they want me there one day a week. You know, that's a little bit different than an eight hour drive for me to get into a Dallas. Now I could fly. Um, it's an hour flight, but again, then you have that expense. And so those are the options that you have to, to weigh out and consider if you're going to do like local jobs. That's what I call a local job. Are you wanting to travel just on the weekends? If that's the case, say um, you uh, only have to work four 10 hour days and you are doing other things in your life, but you, you say, okay, Saturday, um, uh, I want to work on Saturdays, but that's my travel or, or I'm going to travel uh, on the weekends and, and, but I still want to be able to work on the weekends if that's what I, you know, an option. Uh, but say your husband likes to golf, you don't like to golf and you want to go on a golfing trip. Can I work remotely at a different location? 
that is an option. There are uh, there are situations where people will do that. Uh, most remote jobs, they will give you a computer. And the positives in that is that they're usually not very large computers when they do that. Even if it's a desktop, and the desktop it can be very tiny, not any bigger than a book. Um, however, if it is a desktop that they've given you to work off of versus a laptop, you're going to have to bring a monitor with you if you're going to go somewhere for the weekend and you still want to work. Again, not a problem. Uh, easy to do. You can get small monitors now aren't like the big heavy ones, you know, that they used to do. You can even check with where you're staying. And a lot of times you can run those into a TV, right? If it's the right type of TV. Now, that being said, uh, I have traveled and uh, we were going somewhere and I need to work uh, for that week. And I brought my external, one external monitor with me. I had a laptop and an external monitor. Uh, so, you know, that's something to, to consider. You go moving around monitors, you do have um, a higher chance of breaking one. Uh, mine, actually, I wrapped in towels. <laughs> put in a box, special box, to make sure that it was safe. Another option is if you're going to be somewhere and you're going to stay at a hotel, you know, they do have a computer room usually. However, I wouldn't be working out of there. Uh, it's not private. But you might be able to um, get a computer monitor from them. People, these, you know, they usually have uh, monitors and computers, extra computers and stuff. It would be just like getting a uh, playpen, <laughs> right? So we are we need an extra crib or, or whatever. Do you have a monitor? And I'm sure that that could be negotiated out. Now, uh, that being said, what about vacation? Say you're going to go somewhere, you're going to be on vacation, but you'd like to stay extra days so you are going to work some days and um, say, I'm going to be on a two-week vacation, but I don't have that much PTO. So um, I get the weekends off anyway. So I'm going to just work two days a week for two weeks, and then I'll have all those other days off. I've heard of people doing that. Again, that kind of applies to going away for the weekend if you wanted to be able to continue to work. Um, um, that way you, you know, set your laptop up. Uh, again, though, most jobs that are coding jobs, you really need at least two monitors. It's, it's extremely frustrating to do any type of a coding job with one screen. Uh, I, and if you got any of you guys do that, let me know, because that's, that's, not easy to do. The Justin, let's see, I'm looking at some of the things that says I've worked remotely for companies that want a very rigid nine to five Monday through Friday schedule and worked for others that don't care what time of the day or when the week that you work. And I've done the same thing. Uh, that is something you have to consider on a job. Very good point, Justin, because uh, I did work a Oh, great. I'm so glad that you passed, Justin. And thank you uh, for letting us know. Uh, I have worked at jobs where they said, you've got to get 40 hours in. We don't care how you do it and when you do it. But you need to let us know because uh, if uh, we want to, um, you know, support desks and, and help desks and stuff like that need to be available um, in those times sometimes, you know. But again, you can work four 10 hour days. You can work Monday through Friday. You can come in at, you know, five o'clock in the morning. You can come in at eight, it, you know, whatever you want to do. So again, that makes a huge difference. Um, and then uh, let's see. So vacations, kind of everything from the weekend applies. Uh, if you're going to be someplace a, a, an extended period of time, then, and maybe you have an RV or another way to, to get around where you 
can keep all of your desk area stuff secure. Although, let me just state, if you're going on vacation with your family and you have children, you may again fall into the trap of thinking that you can do something when in reality it's not going to work out the way you wanted. Uh, you know, um, working with the children under your feet, uh, which I've done before, <laughs> uh, is not easy. It becomes frustrating for you and frustrating for them uh, because they see you. They can't understand why you're not available to talk to them. And even if um, you're in a room and you shut the door, <laughs> they still know, depending on their age, they still know you're there. And um, they, you know, want to have access to, to, to them, to you. Another option is if you're a snowboarder. Now, if you don't know what that means, uh, my in-laws were full-time snow snowboarders for quite a while as my uh, father-in-law got to retire at a young age. And the the concept behind, behind snowboarders is they live um, the summer months, you know, in the Midwest or the North or wherever you live, but you go down South for the winter. And a lot of people in Texas do that. All the southern states, especially uh, along um, the coastline and the borders, they go to Florida, they go to, you know, um, all, Texas a lot. Uh, Arizona is a big travel spot. And there's even people that will do, you say, uh, southern part of Texas in this uh, in the winter. And in the summer, they'll go up and live in Alaska. So it allows you to travel. Uh, snowboarders, again, may have a home base. Uh, most do. But there are people that are full-time snowbirds uh, that were, my in-laws did that for a lot of years. And uh, you can work at a location that way. So if you know you're going to be six months in in Texas, then you can get a job for six months in Texas. Um, or you could have a remote position. And uh, it most snowbirders live in a uh, RV of some time, a fifth wheel. Uh, fifth wheels are a little more steady when they're pulled. So full-time snowbirders usually tend to get fifth wheels versus travel trailers, which are all one piece, which I'll let you look that, that up. They, um, again, there's not a lot of extra space in these. I think your 40 feet length is, is not going to, uh, about the, the big ones, uh, if I, if I remember right. And, um, however, people that live like this, they, everything has a place and you put it back in its place. So it could, I, there, I know people that travel and are snowboarders and live in an RV and they work remote jobs just absolutely fine. But again, on the next slide, I'm going to talk about some of the pros and cons with that and things that you've got to be aware of. Snowbirders usually don't travel with their children. You're usually retirement age. And as we know, coders don't necessarily retired um, because they, uh, they can keep doing their job if they want. It's real easy to, to do that. Uh, physical limitations don't fall have the same uh, thing as if you've got a job where you've got to pick things up and stuff. International. the If you travel international, you're not going to work. Uh, the internet's not reliable. Your connections, the, the time differences, uh, not going to be an option for you. Now, is there a possibility that you could do that? Maybe you could. However, you're really skimping on security. I just can't see uh, you, them saying, you saying, you know, I'm going to be in Italy for two weeks. I want to be able to keep working. Um, okay, but uh, even how you plug things into the wall is different in Europe than the way we do here. So you'd have to get a converter for the plug for your computer. Um, Again, uh, can you plug in to, you know, um, 
Can you get a monitor and stuff? Can you use any computer? Maybe. But there is some areas that you have to be very mindful of. And those are things like internet access. <laughs> um, now, we know our Laureen, uh, the founder and owner of CCO, she lived overseas. I think I think she lived in Belize. I'm trying to remember where she lived. Maybe it wasn't Belize. But she lived um, international for a year and was able to work. But again, internet is not as free and accessible in other countries as you might find it here in the United States. Um, that and also security. Your internet is probably not secure at all. It, it, you would definitely have to access a VPN. Do, does the VPN work internationally? I don't know how they log that in. I mean, I, I, just about everything I do is off of a VPN and it's in the computer, but that could really be um, a problem. Uh, Lori says, I've seen in groups that not all employers allow Wi-Fi. So yeah, that is absolutely true, Lori. You, there are some that um, don't allow you to use Wi-Fi. You have to be plugged in. Now, you can use secure hotspots, but that's the, the thing, the key word there is secure hotspots, right? And um, not all, um, oh, uh, let's see, VPN works anywhere internet works as long as the firewall isn't blocked. Good point. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Uh, but these are things that you have to be aware of before you decide to hit the road and um, go out there and, and start working uh, remotely or while you're traveling. Now, camper living. Let's let's talk about some of these uh, bullet points. One, we've already talked about internet, and and again, I would just say international is not going to work. Don't think that that's going to be an option. Plus. It would have if you work for a company like a hospital system or something. I'm sure that you would have to get that approved <laughs> uh, to be able. There's just so many compliance issues that I I would think that would be a problem. So just strike that off as too heavy of a pain point. But if you wanted to live in say a fifth wheel or an RV uh, or even a condo someplace, you know that that. Um, and, and travel, uh, then internet's your number one priority. Do they have internet? Is it a mass internet where you have to log in like you would at a hotel? Uh, because if that's the case, then somebody else can come in and tap in to your information. I've seen them do that on shows that were talking about cybersecurity. And they said, if you're in a hotel room and you tap into their internet, then um, the, you know, guy three rooms down can see everything that you're looking at. <laughs> so again, very careful about security. Now, uh, you could, though, have a um, hotspot. Uh, I used a Verizon puck for a very long time. It was secure. However, it cost a lot of money. So be very mindful of the cost and the expense that follows uh, uh, using a remote um, plug to access internet. Electricity has to be reliable. If you are going to travel in an RV of whatever type, uh, you're plugging into their electricity. and um, that usually never has an issue, but there are times that there are issues that could be um, not within your control. Whereas if you live in a house or you live in an apartment, someplace that you're living full time, the thought that your electricity is going to go out would only be if there was a storm, right? It, that you're relying on um, somebody that is providing electricity to multiple um, spots and that doesn't have a power grid the same setup that, you know, an apartment complex does. So be mindful of that. Privacy. Not just the fact that your internet has to be secure, 
But remember, we're talking about looking and accessing legal documents on our monitor. So if you have an external monitor that like I do, that's like 27 inches, I don't know, it's huge. Um, and somebody comes over to say, hey, by the way, you know, can you guys want to come out to the uh, the barbecue pit tonight? We're going to all get together and and everything. And you say, uh, yeah, that'd be great. You can't have that. You're in a smaller space. They can't be looking at your screens, right? That's private information that that you have up on that screen you're not even when you work at home i my monitors and stuff are all turned away from my door at the window that i have uh everything is um, uh, in a position to where if somebody walks into my office to talk to me they can't see what i'm working on and then uh also uh that being said them just walking by your window right? You, you, you're in a small camper. I mean, they're bigger, but you like to open up the windows and stuff, pull the curtains and stuff. And, and if you have a big giant monitor, you, you have to be very mindful of privacy, people seeing your screens, papers laying out that you might have uh, uh, patient information on, can't be doing that. Um, yeah. Uh, Lori, makes a comment here that says, wondering if anyone out there is a full-time RVer and works remote, do you have any issues with internet or do you have any, uh, do you have a portable modem? I would like to hear if you do or don't. I know that Don Self, uh, someone that we know and the CCO knows well, uh, he, they have a an RV that they spend a lot of time in. So he, uh, I'm, I haven't asked him, but I'm curious about what they use. A VPN, VPNs again, they, um, uh, all of my computers that I have have VPNs set up and there is criteria and things that have to be done. Uh, and you need a, uh, a VPN whenever you're dealing with medical um, documentation, security. Uh, what if, what if, if you have a laptop, what if somebody stole your laptop or the company laptop while you were out, you know, uh, uh, you got to be mindful of that and more opportunities for people to do that versus if you're working from home. Uh, space, do you have enough space to work in? Uh, again, I got to have two monitors. There's no way that I could see everything that I need to see. I don't like flipping through pages. I can't remember what I look at from one moment to even flash screens. I got to be able to see that. So do you have enough space for you to have a dedicated work area? And if you live alone, you know, yeah, that can, that may be fine. But if you don't, then if you have a spouse or even your pet, you don't want to have a, an area that your cat could jump on top of your laptop, knock up anything over, crack a monitor, uh, you know, and you know how what they like to do, or a dog's tail is is knocking your stuff over. Be very mindful of space. Another good point is um, the uh, address. Now, there's pros and cons, but when you live in a multiple months, there's area things that snowbirders do. A lot of times they'll have their um, mail forwarded to a central location, meaning, you know, when I'm going to be living in um, Texas, uh, that it comes into the campground and they have a dedicated mail space for me, or I have the post office hold my mail for six months. Um, uh, you know, the, or you get a PO box while you're uh, wherever you're staying because you can pay for that month to month. But why is this something that you have to be aware of? Because your company may need to mail you things. Uh, your um, Most of your W forms are electronic, but not always. And if you're not going to be in one location over an extended period of time, then an address could be concerning. Have a central address location, or if you're going to be, you know, two months here, and then you're going to be two months there, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, 
Uh, oh, this is a good point. For traveling, the only options for internet are local stores like Starbucks, mobile hotspots uh, through cellular companies like AT&T uh, uh, or AT&T and T-Mobile or satellite internet like Viastat and Starlink. And they're not as reliable, right? So if you're having to wait for things or, you know, I've, I had Viastat for a while, it can be um, a problem. And public networks aren't private. So again, be mindful of that. One of the advantages though, oh, I think I touched my thing, is that when you start working remote, you become more and more reliable on going paperless. And so I can tell you that I do have my coding manuals. Um, I can't give them up. I get them every year. However, I hardly use them at all anymore because I have an encoder. I use find a code. So the advantage of um, working remote is that you find your online tools and they're always updated. They um, are always online. So if I were someplace where I needed to do some research and I wanted to go to the library and um, uh, do some work, not coding out charts, but say I needed to do some research and stuff uh, or, or uh, work on a presentation, I could do that and easily access my find a code from anywhere. And as you guys know, I use find a code exclusively. And it was really funny because I was talking, talking to a student today and I was kind of showing them through the the course um, they signed up for the PVC course and uh, they hadn't got their manuals yet and I said well now you can go in and use the free edition of find a code and so I brought it up on the screen and I was showing them what that was and they had actually remembered um, when they were a nurse using find a code and I thought that was funny I was like oh yeah I use that all the time um, now uh, there is, again, advantage is getting used to those online tools, uh, going paperless, and uh, not having to uh, have all of those, you know, carrying around all those coding manuals and other books. Um, but again, that also means you need more screens. Uh, good point. VPN makes any connection private. That is that is ideal. Those are those IT things that uh, it, it, if you want to travel and your employer is saying, oh, I don't know, how about security and so on and so forth. That means you need to do the research ahead of time and let them know this type of information about a VPN making everything secure or otherwise they're just going to sweep you under the rug and say, no, I don't think we're ready. For, you know, we're, we wouldn't like for you to do that. So have all of that information um, for them to let them know that you can work securely and um, also find a code. If you guys decide that uh, you need an encoder, I would check out with them. You can get it, check out them. You know, we love uh, working with them. And um, even before they set up this discount link for us, um, I was using find a code. Now, what type of jobs can you find remote? Um, the, you can work full-time or part-time. And this time of the year, just letting you know, is the big draw for risk adjustment jobs part-time. And uh, they just need to, most of the time, you just need a credential. They'll hire CPCAs uh, and you got to pass a pre-employment exam. And if you can pass that, then they're willing to, to um work you in the past back way back in the day over a decade ago when i first started doing that um they made you go through training that you had to do the training live now most of that's not done live anymore they have it all recorded for you and um, then people there to support you as you get started so that's even more appealing for people who uh, have a job and want to do a, a side job or part-time job remote and especially in risk adjustment is they, you know, and they'll start them like 20 to 40 
uh, hours a week. So full-time or part-time. There are lots of contract jobs out there. And the difference between um, being an employee versus being a contract employee is the main thing is who pays your taxes. <laughs> so if that is concerning to you, then uh, and contract jobs usually have a start and a finish date. Whereas, you know, uh, if you're an employee, you don't. And uh, but taxes, taxes can be a real problem. Now, if you're traveling around, uh, you don't have the overhead expenses that most people have. And, you know, that's fine. But always keep in mind how that affects your taxes. Also, if you're contract, they got to be able to mail you stuff, documents and, and things. Uh hour per or per chart. A lot of remote jobs, especially production jobs, they will uh, either pay you by the hour or by the chart. And uh, when they do per chart, like for risk adjustment, they, uh, not all uh, charts are equal. Now I'm not talking about encounters, I'm talking about charts. So with risk adjustment, you depending, if you're working for an MA plan, for example, you could have you could have three cases that you do, or you could bring up three uh, things in the queue. They each have under 30 pages of documents, or the next one could have 600 pages, and the next one could have a thousand pages. So what they end up doing is uh, paying you per chart, uh, not in counter, and then the ones that have a, a page limit of like under 300, you make this amount. And if it's over uh, 300, then you make this amount. And it can be anywhere from like $6 uh, on this one or on like $12 for higher pages. So that is something that um, you need to to uh, have under your belt. Now, uh, Beth asks, do you have to have training for risk coding positions? Yes, you have to know how to do risk. Uh, risk adjustment coding usually, uh, but they will hire people that have been trained in risk adjustment that are CPCAs. And uh, there are not this close to the end of the year will uh, will they train people with no experience, but further um, um, earlier in the year they'll they'll hire people that don't have risk adjustment that. Um, but this is now when they're running down their contracts and they've, you know, got uh, like 10,000 charts that they've got to have coded. And so they'll hire people to work temporary. Uh, Melissa says, I travel and camp often with my VP and hotspot and web boost travel or web boost home suite. I can work while on the road and while camping without internet interruptions. Melissa Thank you for sharing that because that is some um, names that other people can do some research in. I'm curious, Melissa, if you're willing to share how much it costs you a month for your hotspot and web boost travel. And uh, because that would be uh, something that would be helpful. Also uh, note here, they're saying, Virtual mailbox companies will forage your mail. That is exactly what my in-laws did that were snowbirders. They uh, they had the post office mail uh, hold their mail so that they didn't get like little bit of mailings at a time. And they would say, hold all of our mail for one month. And then the virtual company would uh, take the assign get the mail and then it would be shipped to wherever they're at. So that way, if they chose to move, uh, from one location to another, which they had their time usually planned out. But if they said, hey, you know what, we're going to go and spend uh, two weeks uh, in this one particular area, and uh, they just call up the virtual company and say, I know that you're supposed to be mailing our mail on the 5th. Uh, don't do that. Wait and don't mail it to that location until the 25th. You know, And so virtual mailbox companies very, very helpful. Uh, again, per hour, per chart, often depending on who you work for and what type of a job you do. But the advantages of doing it per chart is it kind of takes the burden off you because if you're slow in the beginning, you're not going to do as many 
and uh, encounters or charts. And so therefore, you're not feeling like you're a burden to them as you're learning and getting that experience under your belt. And if you're really good, then you can knock them out and make real good money compared to other others. So uh, again, there's advantages and disadvantages. Now, uh, uh, the last thing uh, to, to note is that again, uh, jobs on site. Uh, and that is just to remind you that there are some where you do have to come into a location once in a while, or you could get a, um, a temp fill-in job. Um, they, they do have them for coding. If you say, hey, I want to go spend uh, some time in Tennessee, and you have the ability to take off and do that, uh, then there might be a temp job or uh, where you can travel and uh, live in your RV and work at that particular place. You know, uh, a lot of interesting opportunities that you may not have thought about without thinking outside the box, because not of a, not all of us are in a time in our life where we don't have children or home or at home or people that we're caring for that we can just scoop up everything and take off and be on the road. But there's a lot of people that do do it. And so it um, is actually an option for you. Uh, Melissa says, my hotspot's AT&T and I'm not sure the cost. WeBoost uh, can be around $300, but you can get a much better price by watching on eBay. Good to know. And I do know that when I was using Verizon, if I knew I wasn't going to need as much, I could I could taper that down and uh, per month and say, well, I'm going to use only this much. Um, but then uh, uh, next time, uh, next month, hey, bump it up. I'm going to get, you know, 40 gigs or whatever they were called. I can't remember. I was just in the Smokies last week and my Wee Boost worked beautifully. That's great to know because, again, there are places where it's just dead. You can't get internet. Uh, my mother's getting ready to go to a harvest festival, and she was talking about using her square on her phone to for people purchasing things. And she said, but last year our phones didn't work, so the square wouldn't work. So if you can't get internet in a particular place, might be a problem. But if you have something like that, then then it would it would work for you, I'm sure. Um, so do your research, find out. And if there's anything you would like us to discuss, we have several um, uh, avenues. We have our live CCO lives again, which are casual. We converse with you online, talk and, and kind of have fun, a uh, little more lightweight topics. Or we have our student webinars and our CCO club webinars that some of those we may air, but they're pulled down and put in our exclusive club. We've got some really interesting exclusive um, uh, only to club members will get to see these presentations uh, next week. So if you're interested in them, I'll tell you more about those in a minute. But uh, submit your topic requests real easy to do at cco.us forward slash topic hyphen request. Let us know what you would like to hear. And uh, also, if you're not already a part of our CCO club, it's cco.us forward slash club. That's where the exclusive content happens. All of the past presentations that we have done are in there. You may have noticed that we're on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn a lot. But then if you go back to our YouTube channel, that content's not still there. That's because it was, it was you got it to see it, but it was pulled down exclusive uh, to stay in the club members, get all that content transcribed, and uh, a lot of CEUs applied to those type of things as well. So thank you for joining us, guys. I hope you had fun. We love what we do. And the way that you can show us that you appreciate what we do for you and the free content that we give you is to one, give us topics to talk about. If there's something that's a need, then um, we can answer those for you. But also by liking, subscribing, sharing, let other people know that we're out here. We don't really advertise too much. And um, uh, again, let other people know by uh, taking advantage of those social media 
cues to get the word out and don't let us uh, and, and again keep us up to date on what is happening in your world through the club so that we know what, that we can bring content that's applicable to your needs. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate seeing some new faces and new names out there. See you next time. Bye-bye. Do you need more medical certification and business training? Learn more at www.cco.us.